Today on Straight Talk Africa, the Republican National Convention comes to a close Thursday night. That's when Donald Trump outlines his agenda for the nation and officially accepts his party's nomination for President of the United States. We'll have reaction from the African diaspora next, right here on Straight Talk Africa. Hello, welcome to Straight Talk Africa, live from the Voice of America studios here in Washington. It's Wednesday, July 20th. I am Shaka Sali. And hello to all our viewers and listeners on the continent and elsewhere. I'm Ayan Bior, your social media reporter. Today, we'll talk about the African diaspora reaction to the Republican National Convention in Cleveland, Ohio. And coming up later in our STA inbox, our audience has weighed in on our topic through emails and Facebook comments, and we will take a look at some of them ahead on Straight Talk Africa. Businessman Donald Trump outlasted more than a dozen Republican presidential candidates to win the party's official nomination on Tuesday night. His former rivals and Republican leaders are rallying behind the New York billionaire to battle presumptive Democratic nominee Hillary Clinton. VOS Jim Malone has more from Cleveland. Delegates and alternates. Donald Trump's long shot campaign for president paid off big Tuesday when Republicans formally confirmed him as their nominee for president following the traditional roll call of the states. Donald Day Trump. Having received a majority of these votes entitled to be cast at the convention, has been selected as the Republican Party nominee for President of the United States. It was Trump's home state of New York that clinched the nomination, and the tally was announced by his son, Donald Jr. Congratulations, Dad! We love you! And for the second straight night, Trump broke with tradition and spoke to the convention this time in a live video hookup from his office in New York. Together we've achieved historic results with the largest vote total in the history of the Republican Party. This is a movement, but we have to go all the way. With Trump's nomination secure, Republicans moved to heal their party after a divisive primary battle and seemed eager for the general election campaign. House Speaker Paul Ryan. What do you say that we unify this party at this crucial moment when unity is everything? Scenes of unity inside the hall were in sharp contrast. With protests that continue just a few blocks away. Though most of the demonstrations have been peaceful, a scuffle did break out Tuesday when anti-Trump protesters clashed with a conservative talk show host, which brought a swift reaction from police. He understands. Meanwhile, former rivals for the nomination, including retired surgeon Ben Carson and New Jersey Governor Chris Christie, took aim at Democrat Hillary Clinton. We know exactly what four years of Hillary Clinton will bring, all the failures of the Obama years, but with less charm and more lies. Josh Price, a Trump delegate from New York, says the country is ready for a political outsider. I think that he comes across very well as someone who's blunt, who's direct, and who doesn't talk like a politician. Ohio delegate Dan Carter opposed Trump in the primaries, but is now ready to back him. I mean, there's always animosity. Hell, I still got problems with Rockefeller Republicans, but we all work together. I was a Barry Goldwater guy. On Wednesday, the convention focus turns to foreign policy. Jim Malone, VOA News, at the Republican National Convention in Cleveland. Thanks, Jim, for that report. Uh, now let's go to live to Cleveland for the latest developments from the Republican Convention itself. And standing by is my colleague, Vincent Macaulay, host of VOA's Africa 54 program. Hello, Vincent. Yeah, hi, Shaka. How are you? I'm doing well. What is the mood like uh, where you are? Well, I have to say it depends on where you are standing. If you are inside the arena uh, where the convention is taking place, there has been a celebratory mood, uh, excitement, especially after the official nomination of Mr. Trump uh, yesterday evening. 
But of course, on the outside, on the streets of Cleveland, there have been sustained protests from the anti-Trump uh, uh, groups and also some who support him. And so it's a, it's a lot of excitement, uh, but it all depends on where you are, uh, whether you are in the uh, arena or you're outside. It's exciting. Now, talking about uh, the streets of uh, Cleveland, uh, do I understand correctly, for example, that uh, it's illegal for permitted citizens to carry loaded machine guns on the streets? Well, well the laws here in Ohio allow a person to carry his uh, legally owned and registered uh, a firearm on the streets and so we ran into a number of uh, protesters who are carrying their rifles uh, they had no problem with the police or with anybody because it's uh, accepted here and they wanted to make a point they wanted to say that uh, you know they can carry these arms and uh, they have no uh, that nobody has any reason to to fear uh, because they are not having they don't have these arms to kill anybody but just, just to protect themselves. So it was interesting to see this. Uh, for me, I have not really seen people walk on the streets with their rifles except uh, for law enforcement officers. So what about you? Uh, don't you have uh, any fear? Are you scared or are you in fact carrying perhaps <laughs> a bulletproof vest? Well, that is an option that was given to us uh, by the Voice of America, actually. We had a uh, bulletproof uh, vest. I did not carry any. They're so heavy. Uh, but I haven't felt any cause to, you know, to fear. There hasn't been any reason to make me feel like uh, my life could be threatened. Uh, the protests have been, uh, to a large extent, uh, you know, peaceful. Of course, there have been skirmishes here and there, but nothing to, uh, to that level where you feel that you could actually be in, uh, you know, harm's way uh, to the extent that you really need to protect yourself. Uh, with a bulletproof vest or helmet. No, it did not come to that point. It hasn't come to that point. Now, Vincent, I was looking at uh, the Republican Party platform 2016 uh, section on Africa, uh, and it talks about uh, advancing hope and uh, prosperity in Africa. What specifically does that mean? Well, uh, it means uh, that, uh, the, you know, Trump, if he becomes president, he wants to give hope to Africans that he's not necessarily the person that people think he is who really doesn't like, uh, you know, Africa or Africans. He, he, you know, they want to, to say that, uh, you know, under his presidency, his foreign policy will be all encompassing. It will not ignore the continent of Africa, but we know he has come under criticism. Uh, many people don't think he really cares about the continent. He hasn't mentioned Africa so much. In fact, uh, for those who are immigrants in this country from the African countries, feel that uh, the stance he has taken, particularly regarding immigration, uh, you know, does touch on Africans who live here as immigrants, and therefore he doesn't necessarily have uh, that uh, compassion for Africans. So I think the, 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 uh, the campaign is going to try and uh, project him as a person who cares about not only the rest of the world but Africa, but his focus is how to make Africa progress, Africa take care of itself, uh, because his, his message is that America needs to lead, and therefore if America is going to lead, it will also lead on the issues of foreign policy that touch on the continent of Africa. Well, I was going to ask you whether you have run into a lot of people who have come from Africa to attend the convention. I can tell you it's been uh, very difficult to find anybody who has come from Africa who has a connection with Africa. I've been walking around uh, the arena, I've been walking around the streets of this city to try and find somebody who came specifically for this convention who is from Africa or has an African connection. And I'm telling you, uh, I haven't succeeded up to this point, which tells you a lot about what maybe Africans think about the Trump presidency. They don't connect with him, and they don't know if he's going to connect with the continent. On that note, Vincent, thanks a lot, of course, uh, for joining us all the way from Cleveland. You're welcome. Thank You're you. Welcome. It's a, it's Thank you. Joining us in our Washington studio is Awet T. World Mikhail. Associate Professor of History at Queen's University, Ontario, Canada. Well, I have to say frankly, Awet, that uh, I am profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host you for the first time the on Straight Talk all, Africa. The honor is mine. I'm delighted to be here and thank you for inviting me, Shaka. It's a pleasure that you could finally come. Absolutely. And Dr. Munini Mulera, 
a consultant physician and analyst of African affairs. He joins us from VOA Studios in London. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Mlera, for joining us this time around from London. Thank you, Shaka, for inviting me. It's an honor. How are you? You are most welcome, Dugu. Later Thank in you. the program, we'll give you, the audience, a chance to call and talk with our guests. The number to call is 202-619-3111. And this country code is one. Let me come to you uh, uh, immediately. I'll wait. Uh, what is your immediate reaction? Uh, you heard that... Uh, Vincent, our reporter in Cleveland, can hardly, in fact, run into uh, Africans who have come from the continent to attend the convention. What does that say? Well, that says uh, where the priority of uh, potential Trump presidency is going to look like. Um, but before I, uh, I talk along those lines, let me uh, give you my reaction as an outsider looking in at the convention, which was a splendid display of American uh, freedom, which is the envy of so many people who wish to come and uh, make uh, uh, America their, their home. Um, unfortunately, I fear that splendid uh, display of freedom may be at risk of being uh, uh, whittled down or, uh, or, or undermined mm -hmm. by what may uh, uh, happen in November. Uh, the fact that your own correspondent, Vincent, was offered uh, bulletproof vests to cover a political democratic convention inside the United States as if he's in a war zone uh, is, is very telling of uh, where uh, we may be heading come November. Obviously, you know what has been happening. You know what happened, for example, in Baton Rouge, Louisiana. You know what happened recently in Dallas. You know what happened in Minneapolis and what have you. Are you surprised about that? Yes, I am surprised. Um, I am surprised because um, whatever I may think analytically um, or whatever I look at analytically over a long period of time, I always uh, hold the United States of America at a higher pedestal and I expect more. Mm -hmm. um, what happened in uh, Baton Rouge, uh, Louisiana or, or, or um, in, in uh, Minnesota and what as a consequence happened um, or related to it happened in Dallas is a tragedy of epic proportions. Um, that does not surprise me, given the long history of racism uh, and, and discrimination uh, by uh, police uh, in, in this country mm -hmm. against people of color in general, black men in particular. Um, but that a political convention of the leading or one of the two leading political parties in mm -hmm. this country mm -hmm. has to be covered by journalists with bulletproof vests as if they are in a war zone, however, surprises me beyond measure. As a historian, you have to accept the fact that uh, this country has done reasonably well, especially given that uh, Jim Crow laws really didn't probably end until uh, perhaps four decades ago. Have, 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 has the U.S. come a long way? Absolutely. But it has a lot longer to go. Very true. Dr. Munini Murera, your reaction to the convention in Cleveland from your vantage point? Well, certainly I see democracy on display for two reasons. First of all, Donald Trump was not exactly expected to be the nominee, but here he is, showing you that democracy can uh, uh, be annoying for some, but uh, democracy is democracy. And secondly, seeing those demonstrations outside the convention hall with minimal police interference is very, very uh, challenging, because as an African, I cannot imagine citizens of any African country doing so, certainly the majority of them would be beaten for even appearing near a convention center. Uh, so there are some lessons to learn. One uh, thing about uh, the gun question, uh, to me, is again a reflection on what Mr. Trump has done. I think uh, Mr. Trump has exploited racism, xenophobia, and anger within the United States, a certain segment of it, to win the nomination. Now, whether or not 
He actually is racist or xenophobic, I don't know, and I would even guess that he probably is not. But uh, he has a lot of damage control to do, uh, in fact, a lot of work to undo the damage that he has done with the rhetoric that he has used over the last uh, several months or so. Very interesting. Now we'll pause for a short break and would like to remind you that Straight Talk Africa is now on the social networking website Twitter. And we are tweeting live. Follow us at VOA Shaka. That's VOA Shaka. And join in on today's discussion with your questions and comments. Don't forget to use the hashtag VOA Republican Convention. And we are still on Facebook. Just enter the keyword Straight Talk Africa. Become a fan and connect with other friends of the Voice of America. We'll be right back with you. So please, don't go away. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. What is your opinion about today's topic? Call us at 202-619-3111. U.S. country code 1. When you call, remember the following. Ask only one question. Keep your comment brief and turn down the volume on your radio or television. Now let's return to Straight Talk Africa. I think this is an opportunity for us to educate our people. The uh, Republican Party was started as an anti-slavery movement. And so for me, that historical fact is the reason why I aligned myself with the party. It's since changed, but I hope to be a voice as a GOP leader, uh, boots on the ground, so to speak, to cultivate my community, which is a predominantly black community in Queens, New York. Welcome back, and that was alternate delegate uh, Shelley Murray from New York talking to VOA's Vincent Marcoli. Let me come back to London, uh, uh, Dr. Monini. Uh, we had to go for a break. Of course, there's no democracy, I can assure you, in Studio 52, because if the producer says you go, you must go, just like a good soldier. You, you talked about uh, Donald Trump, and of course you talked about how he was least perhaps expected by many people uh, to be, frankly, in a position where he is right now, a man who is obviously right now knocking at the doors of the White House. Any particular reason why everything that has been uh, thrown at him, including kitchen sinks, have not been able to stick? Are we talking about a Teflon Donald Trump here, just like at one time? a Teflon Ronald Reagan, perhaps? I don't think that uh, Donald Trump would be a Ronald Reagan at all. As a matter of fact, if I may paraphrase uh, what uh, uh, Mr. Benson said, I knew Ronald Reagan. <laughs> I admired Ronald Reagan. Donald Trump is no Reagan. Uh, because uh, Ronald Reagan actually did believe in something, and I did not always agree with him. But you knew that he truly believed in an America that was ascendant, an America that was powerful on the international stage. He believed in capitalism in its, in its classic sense. He believed in small government, though, in fact, uh, he lost a little bit of uh, control over that. But you knew where he was going. I have a sense that Donald Trump has a exploited populism, has exploited the anger that is within uh, the American people, and especially at a time of uh, terrorism, because the terrorists have created this fear among us, all of us around the world. And anyone who comes saying that them, the foreigners, the Muslims, them, those people, must go and it makes us feel safe, that person gets support. The problem is, Mr. Trump, he probably knows that that's not going to cut it. And he has created this tension within America and within the world that may well be hard for him to contain, and especially when he fails to deliver on what he has promised repeatedly. Talking about uh, Ronald Reagan, uh, do you believe, uh, like uh, President Barack Obama once said, uh, that uh, Ronald Reagan perhaps may in fact have brought about uh, a sort of trajectory change in America? 
I think he definitely uh, did, uh, um, and especially coming in after the period of the 70s and uh, after Vietnam, after a lot of the uh, scandals that had occurred in uh, America, but also after there had been that shift from the time of uh, Lyndon Johnson uh, to, uh, up until uh, Jimmy Carter, where America was becoming more and more a welfare type of state, at least more tolerant that way. Reagan shifted it back to you have to work to succeed. And we will reward hard work and industry, and we will uh, not be so, go so easy on those who are, who are in need. So I think um, he shifted uh, uh, the attitudes of the, the Americans, but also gave Americans the confidence to know that they were a powerful nation in the world. And he did not have to be uh, rude, he did not have to be arrogant about it, he did not have to be unagreeable. He was a man who could tell you that we shall defeat you, and he would do it with a smile. Uh, the Russians didn't realize what really hit them because Reagan was an easy guy to underestimate. If I sound like one who admired him, it's because I did, even when I disagreed with him. Very interesting, of course, uh, Reagan is uh, largely known for having said, Gorbachev, tear that wall. And of course, uh, the wall came crumbling <laughs> right. a few years later. Right. Do you agree with him? Uh, yes, yes and no. Um, too much admiration of Reagan, however, risks um, hiding some of the many things uh, that he did wrong and the mess that Ob the Obama administration inherited, for example, mm -hmm. started with uh, the reforms that Reagan administration began. For example? So the economic uh, crisis, for example, is one of them. Trickle-down theory? Yes. Some call this, in fact, trickle-down blood. I, you call, you're calling it. I, <laughs> I wouldn't really? call it that. But, uh, mm -hmm. yes, that's one of them. Um, having said that, however, Reagan is a lot more progressive on more issues than one would expect from the neoconservatives, the, the Tea Partiers, the flip-flop Trump Republican types. Um, everyone uh, refers to Donald Trump, uh, to, to Donald Reagan as the exemplar of Republican values when Ronald in fact... Reagan you mean? Yes they, yes, they refer to Ronald Reagan as exemplar of Republican values, but on more issues, um, he is progressive than they have been, and most definitely more progressive than the current platform on which Donald Trump is running on. But what about Trump? He seems to run into some problems, frankly, with some conservative Republicans who say he is not conservative enough. Well... I, I wouldn't speak for them, but they have a reason to say that. Uh, repeatedly, he has stated and he has supported Democratic and other uh, neutral candidates. This is a business person who put uh, his money and his name where he felt he could get something out of it. Um, when he realized he would stand a better chance of winning on a Republican ticket, Mm. He has no problem speaking Republican uh, or conservative That's language. Right. And he has repeatedly uh, used uh, populist language to stir feelings and exploit the anger among white male uh, uh, electorate. It's very, to, it's very interesting that uh, you specifically point to white male electorate because there are some people, in fact, who have been criticizing the Republican Party uh, for having been unable, for example, uh, to create uh, a party that looks or reflects America, bringing about some sort of cultural diversity, for example. When you look at the optics in the Cleveland, you look at those pictures, for example, uh, you pretty much you are looking at uh, white male, possibly even older for that matter. Exactly, exactly. This Can is... you win with this sort of constituency without bringing on board uh, people from other um, cultural backgrounds? I honestly don't know if he can or cannot win because in the past 18 years that I've been in the U.S., um, this, I've, I've seen ele the electoral process go in an unpredictable ways. Um, but what I can tell you is that um, 
I hope he does not win Why? Under, under the current. First of all, um, the image of America that he has been promoting and that the, the right wing, especially the Tea Partiers, uh, new, new uh, Republicans are exposing or put, putting forward is white Anglo-Saxon Protestant America. Mm -hmm. um, you have said in the past four decades uh, the U.S. has uh, made tremendous progress and I completely agree with you and part of that progress is the diversification not only of the of the base of the American demographics but also the acceptance of even more mm. which is the defining feature of what America is historically and I hope in the future as well the Republican Party especially the current platform on which uh, Donald Trump is running is retrograde in many respects and does not see a room for non-white, non-Anglo-Saxon uh, 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 Protestants. But what about uh, the white constituency itself, really? When you're looking at uh, two former presidents, for example, who have boycotted this convention, you're talking about uh, Bush Sr. and Bush, uh, uh, you know, uh, Bush W. And you're also talking about uh, the most recent Republican flag bearers. We're talking about Romney and we're talking about McCain. Um, to what extent does this make him really a man who can in fact unite his own party? Well the best face of unity that I've seen in the convention of the past two days, I don't know what's happening today, uh, is uh, Paul Ryan. Paul Ryan is the only person who tried to speak the language of unifying the party. Mm -hmm. But even that the has... Speaker, had, the speaker, the, of, the speaker of, of, of the House, of the House. has been the only person who is talking uh, the language of unifying the party. Everyone else has only been talking about what Ronald, uh, Donald uh, Trump is and is not. And that is just a non-starter from my point of view. What about the fact that uh, the governor of Ohio State himself, Governor Kesik, in fact, is missing in action? Precisely. That speaks volumes about how unifying this person is going to be. But there, there are some serious challenges in this country. There are economic issues. There are security issues. And some of them are real. Others are exaggerated by media pandits and other uh, political uh, manipulators. If this candidate does his homework and mm -hmm. stop blathering, um, addresses core issues that are affecting American lives, average Americans, and recognizes that America is not that angry white male only. Mm -hmm. He stands a good chance, regardless of the political party bigwigs, he has a good chance of mobilizing more of the electorate. But the current platform seems to preclude that. Mm -hmm. Not that Trump has been the most loyal, scripted kind of a candidate. Mm. He is the most wild, uh, unpredictable character when in front of the cameras. But the platform that the party has prepared for him, which by and large, by the way, toes the line of Donald Trump, be it on the wall, be it on America first, be it on economic and foreign policy, we can talk about that in more detail later, it toes the Donald Trump language. That seems to preclude him from mobilizing more of the real American face than just one sector of that society. Very interesting. You are tuned in to Straight Talk Africa. We'll have more of a discussion in a moment. Come, we'll take a look at some of the fantastic feedback we've received from you, our audience, through social media. This is Straight Talk Africa on The Voice of America. Call us now with your questions and comments. The number is 202-619-3111 and the U.S. country code is 1. Call us direct and we'll call you right back. Remember to turn down the volume on your radio or television and keep your comments brief. Now back to Straight Talk Africa. Thank you very much, Esther Gidu, you what? And welcome back to Straight Talk Africa, live from Washington. It's time to bring in my colleague and social media reporter, Ayen. Take it away again, Ayen. Well, thanks again, Shaka. We received tremendous feedback in our STA inbox to this week's question. 
Donald Trump has won the Republican Party's presidential nomination. This leads us to our question of the week, which asks, what do you expect Donald Trump to say about Africa at the Republican National Convention? Well, starting off the conversation is Gifted Mine with our letter of the week. Our letter of the week comes from Gifted Mine Icon from Uganda, who writes, Donald Trump will allow Africans to make their own decision about the future of the African continent, which will prove the true independence of Africa. He will also recognize that America will do better and strengthen its security if only they work together with Africa as an equal partner and not putting Africa as second class. Africa is and will always be a better trading partner for the U.S. if it is recognized and respected in the international community like the rest of the continents. Very interesting take there. Now, before we begin, I'd like to thank all of you for using all our social media platforms to communicate with us. And another reminder that we are tweeting live today. Use the hashtag BOA Rep Convention. And if you haven't yet, please do follow us at BOA Shaka. And speaking of, let's go to a tweet from Ramond from Kenya, who writes, his speech won't change its full its his speech won't change it's full of racism excuse me and we have another tweet from Roni Wayne who tweets I wouldn't be amused whatever Trump says he's a total surprise another tweet from Emmanuel Cachelle who tweets he'll abuse Africa it's the way he can treat it he is the mockery of American democracy he is questionable And our last tweet is from Prospero, who tweets, I expect him to be polite and gentle and say what needs to be, re and say what needs to be respected and supported. Now to a comment from Facebook fan Helen Oyekan from the UK, who's, who says, I expect Donald Trump to say Africa has a lot to learn when he speaks at the Republican National Convention. To say that Africans need to take their continent to the international market as equals to the Western and Gulf countries rather than expecting loans, donations, and handouts. Africa has many resources. It should be completely self-sufficient. Africans should help each other succeed instead of the affluent embezzling and money laundering while the masses suffer the consequences of a corrupt few. Well, Shaka, some very interesting points made here. What do you have to say? Very interesting. Uh, Dr. Mlela, are you with us? You do go. Your reaction to that, please. Well, a couple of uh, people, or three, uh, seem to uh, be hungry for uh, Donald Trump saying certain things about Africa and good things about Africa and so on. Frankly, What he says about Africa is not as important to me as what Africa itself does to make itself come onto the stage and realize its full potential. America will not determine what happens to Africa. Africans will determine what happens to our continent. First of all, we need to respect human rights of African people elevate each and every life in Africa to be a valued member of the international community. Democracy should be a given. Americans are not going to make Africa democratic. The Africans must, and they must claim it themselves. Corruption. Corruption is, of course, there are partners from America and Britain here and elsewhere who are in partnership with the corrupt in Africa. But my concern, I'm only interested in the African player in this corruption game. The Africans must fight corruption and fight it hard. We must begin to look at our resources as our gift from God, and we must share those resources and prepare ourselves to compete on the international stage. We have had presidents of the United States speak in the past. They have said a lot of great words, many words that people have zeroed in on and hung on to as if they were going to change Africa. Well, they haven't. And the reason they haven't is because Africa can only be changed by Africans. 
the president of the United States serves the interests of America, and so he should. Donald Trump, if he becomes president, will serve the interests of America. Now, if those interests align with Africa's interests, then we may benefit. But we will benefit even more if we are in position to be an attractive market, a place where people want to invest, and where we can compete on the international uh, stage. So it really, to me, it doesn't matter that much what the President of the United States has to say about Africa. Well, I guess what I understand from Dr. Mnini Mulera is that Africa, first and foremost, must identify its own vital national security interests. Ayen? That's right. Any more reaction from the audience, please? Yes, we do. Let's go to another comment from a Facebook fan, Greens Kansime, from the DRC, who writes, Trump should say that America should enhance its good relationship with Africa's leaders, promote democracy, human rights, trade, and tourism. And our last Facebook comment comes from Mugisha Frank from Kampala, Uganda, who writes, Donald Trump would be disastrous for Africa because he hates Africans. Well, Shaka, again, um, a, a couple of interesting comments. What's your take? Very interesting. Um, Owen, it's all yours. Well, I agree by and large with Dr. Bolera that the fate of Africa is ultimately uh, dependent on what we Africans do with our countries and our continent. Mm. But let's not kid ourselves. Africa is not going to do much in isolation of, of the world. And again, let's not kid ourselves. The U.S. is a global superpower mm -hmm. with vested interests across the continent of Africa. Mm -hmm. What the U.S. says and does is definitely going to carry a lot of weight and will have real-life consequences to Africa and Africans. So it matters to us what Donald Trump uh, is going to say or going to do should he be elected come November. Unfortunately, I fear he doesn't have much to say and he doesn't have much to contribute to Africa, given I'm not, say, I'm not conclusively saying this, but I'm basing myself mm -hmm. on his rhetoric so far and on the platform on which he's running. The platform clearly talks about building walls, which he spoke about. If a leader of this great country builds wall, physical wall, with its immediate neighbor to the south, what kind of relationship can you expect from him with far off African countries, number one? Number two, this whole talk about America first discusses about renegotiating American trade relations with the rest of the world. Well, Africa and the U.S. have had trade relations that has been promoted by AGOA or Africa Growth and Opportunity Act that came into effect in 2000. That was the late final years of the Bill Clinton administration. In an effort to open Africa for trade, there was some kind of preferential treatment so to encourage Africa to mm -hmm. do more transparent business with Africa. Uh, with the United States, uh, excuse me. Um, but the war on terror has completely put the economic aspect of the relationship by the wayside, and the relationship with Africa has been heavily militarized mm -hmm. and security oriented. So that trade during the entire period of Bush administration, the whole eight years, has grown into negative uh, uh, trade relationship, into a deficit. So Bush inherited about 15 billion deficit in Africa-US trade relations. Mm -hmm. During the final, during his eight years, this trade deficit has been growing incrementally. In 2008, end of 2008, it had grown to a whopping $80 billion trade deficit. The Obama administration has incrementally decreased that trade deficit in spite of the fact that 55% there has been 55% drop mm -hmm. in American export of foreign oil, mm -hmm. which made the bulk of, of African uh, export. There is still vibrant uh, uh, trade relationship that under the Obama administration has just balanced. Under uh, Trump uh, platform, this is very likely to be compromised. Then let's talk about security. 
the Trump platform talks about security in an isolationist sense, as if the United States of America lives completely isolated from the rest of the world, mm -hmm. as if everyone around the world wants to harm the United States of America. This is a sense of paranoia which has been fabricated by the Trump uh, candidacy or Trump campaign, as well as the uh, extreme right-wing uh, Republicans to, to m continue to militarize African or U.S. relationship with the rest of the world. That is going to be harmful to African relations with the United States. We'll come to a little bit more of that later in the program. Thanks, Ayen, for bringing us this week's audience reaction. Well, that does it for today's social media segment. Just a reminder that we appreciate all the feedback, whether it's in social media form or using other means to communicate with us. Please keep them coming. And if you're a new fan, do drop us a line at africatv at voanews.com. Once again, our email address is africatv at voanews.com. Or post your comment on our Facebook page. Enter the keyword Straight Talk Africa. Be sure to visit us online at voaafrica.com or you can join our YouTube channel, sign up to VOA TV to Africa and follow us on Twitter at VOA Shaka. A reminder that the show is streaming live every Wednesday. Go to VOA Straight Talk Africa TV program page on our website or simply watch us live on your mobile device. Just download the VOA mobile app. Now let's take a look at what's on tap for next week's program. Next week on Straight Talk Africa, Shaka Sali and his guests will discuss the Democratic National Convention and what a Hillary Clinton presidency could mean for Africa. I will get up every day and do all that I can to make a real difference for you, your families, and our country. Thank you all so much, and God bless you. That's next week, right here on Straight Talk Africa. Welcome back, and today we are, of course, talking about the African diaspora reaction to the Republican National Convention. Our distinguished guests are Awet T. World Michael, Associate Professor of History at Queen's University of Ontario, Canada, and Dr. Munini Morera, a consultant physician and analyst of African affairs. Gentlemen, I have to say that I'm profoundly honored and exceedingly humbled to have the opportunity to host the two of you on Straight Talk Africa. Thank you. Thank you, Ndugushaka. It's been a pleasure. You're most welcome. Now, Dr. Muller, of course, uh, you talked about uh, the fact that there seems to be uh, uh, an interest sort of deficit when it comes to African leaders. What about the fact that uh, African leaders have remarkable advantages this time around, especially because they do not only have to engage Washington or the West as it were, but you are talking about a different world completely. We are talking about the BRICS, for example. We're talking about uh, Brazil, we're talking about Russia, India, China, and South Africa. And what about the role of people like you and me, the African diaspora? What can we do in order to influence the manner in which capitals like Washington interact with Africa, a continent where we were born? I think the most important thing is for Africans, wherever they are, to get involved in the political process, the economic process, the discussions within their countries. So those in the United States should be very, very engaged. And incidentally, I would encourage them not to just go with one party. I would suspect that many may feel more comfortable with perhaps the Democratic Party. But they should be engaged with the Republican Party as well. So being involved is key. And secondly, speaking out for the rights and freedoms of African people back in our home countries. I think those are two key areas, in addition to what people are already doing, that is economic investment, promoting Africa as a tourist destination, promoting Africa as a place that, has, uh, that offers opportunities for investment and very, very good profit, a good uh, profit uh, margin for those who are willing to take the risks. On the other hand, though, we would hope that 
the African people, especially the African governments, make it easy for us to sell Africa. Because if I am going to promote an African country, I am from Uganda. If I am going to promote Uganda, which I try to do as much as I can, I would want the Ugandan government to create an environment that makes it possible for the citizens to live in freedom, makes it possible for foreign investors to have the confidence to come in and know that they can count on the long term, that they can have justice, that the judicial system is independent enough uh, that someone who invests can be protected. So that, again, I keep push saying that the ball is in the court of Africa first, and particularly those who are in power in Africa, to make it an attractive place for people to invest, and so that we in the diaspora can do our part to encourage, to support our continent. Well, point well made. Uh, let me go to the lifeline of the show, which are the telephone callers. Uh, good afternoon, uh, Ted La from New York. You're most welcome straight talk Africa after a very, very long time. Yes, uh, good afternoon, Shaka. I'm hugely terrific. How are you, Tedla? Very well, thank you very much. Uh, let me be honest with you. Uh, when your guests come over there telling us about uh, Donald Trump, maybe racist behavior, what do Africans get electing the first Kenyan to be the president of the United States? Kenyan is an American, definitely. I'm not like Donald Trump. Obama administration. Go back to the Clinton administration and the Bush administration. After 9-11, Africa is seen as a battleground, nothing more than that. Whatever economic policy the United States might have is all now downgraded to security. So whatever we are doing in Africa, Donald Trump is not going to be uh, on stage and curse Africans. He will not do that. If you say that Donald Trump is a racist, I don't buy that argument. Donald Trump might not be informed about Africa. Donald Trump might not give the list of African leaders. If you ask him, he might not even mention one African leader. Hillary Clinton can list all the African leaders. That should not be our criteria. For Africans, we should have our independence. Uh, one of your gentlemen was said, Africa is not independent. Africans, they have no the right to elect their own leaders. The sad struggle, it doesn't matter whether Donald Trump or Hillary Clinton, it doesn't change. So for us, the right of the Africans is, what do we get by electing a black man to be an American leader? Nothing, zero. Let me tell Thank you that. Thank you. Thank you, Tedler. Thank you very much, Tedler. And of course, uh, you are a lawyer in New Yorker, perhaps, but I think you made your point. Let's go to somewhere from Uganda. Good evening, Samuel. You're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Uh, good evening, Zubushaka. How are you? I am hugely terrific. How are you, Samuel? Thank you very much for bringing in Dugu Amonini Murela. Uh -huh. The last time I checked, I know he's a Canadian uh, doctor. Uh -huh. uh, now, uh, let me go to Mr. Awet. Yes. How is the, the Donald Trump administration going to tackle the Muslim? and racial question, because he is seen as oriented to only the Christian norms, whereas we have to coexist with all religious affiliation, be it Muslim community. About the gun control, we do not Trump control the sale and acquisition of guns, or we he openly support the traditional right for possession. And how is he going to win the African hearts? Are we seeing him as someone going for Africa and, the, and its democratic principles? What is your take, uh, Mr. Witt? Thank you, Shaka. Thank you very much, Samuel, all the way from Uganda. Let's go to uh, Camelot from Tanzania. Good evening, Camelot. You're most welcome to Straight Talk Africa. Good evening, Mr. Habari. Mzuri, Habarigani Ndugu. Mzuri sana. Yes, sir. What is your question, sir? No, I just wanted to comment on the discussion right now. You have a minute. 
No, I, I just want to witness that I've been seeing, I've been seeing the uh, changing of the American administration fourth time, and the people are very much disappointed. The people are very much worried of the changing of the the the, the administration. But finally, if you 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 just evaluate after four or eight years, you find nothing has been contributed to the Africa. And it is our 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 all, all the time that we think that the administration when it's changing we expect to get something from the America. But it's my my point of view, I think we must work hard we as the Africans and not just worry about the changing of the American administration. So I just want to comment on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, I wait. Uh... Um I, I understand the frustration of uh, Ted La calling from New York. Um, but an American president's principal job is to serve American people and American interests. So we cannot complain about President Obama for doing his job well. In fact, he has done uh, a lot of really, I mean, he has done, eno he, made, he has made enormous contributions, frankly, to Africa. You're talking about power Africa, electricity. You're talking about uh, the Mandela Washington Fellowship, which brings 500 students here each year for the last five years. He has. Huh? He has. Hmm? But also, by, by given how consequential things in America are for Africa, improving the conditions on the ground here in the U.S. is very, very important. And having inherited a, a, an economic mess, this president has pulled the country out of the mess that it was oh, yes. and put it at a, at a higher gear, and American economy is doing much better. Guess what? Look at the public opinion in polls. That He's a very popular ex president. Exactly. Who is supposed to be a lame duck president on his way out. Exactly. Exactly. So um, what we can complain about, however, and this is where I have a comment to Tedla, is what our leaders are doing with their own power and in their interaction with this favorable president of this most powerful country. Mm -hmm. That's one. And then there was a more specific question by Samuel from Uganda. Mm -hmm. um, I don't expect much from a Donald Trump presidency. This is a man who insults women, who insults uh, uh, people with disabilities, who has openly called for a ban on Muslims coming into this country when there are over three million Muslims already in the US who are American citizens and born American nationals. Um, he is very anti-immigrant. You know, he said he was, a, he was a great friend of the late Muhammad Ali. <laughs> Muhammad Ali. That's, that's, that's mockery. That's mockery, um, especially because about half of Africans are Muslims. So when you are banning the the entry of Muslims, you are automatically ruling out half of Africans coming into this country. What Even about, uh, what about uh, the Middle East, uh, where in fact he actively does business, very big business? Exactly. It, it's, it, the, the, the list is endless, but to bring the discussion back to Africa, mm. uh, with ha at least half of Africans Muslims uh, barred from coming into the U.S., even George W. Bush, during his presidency after September 11, mm. did not introduce such draconian anti-immigrant policies. Um, on top of this about Donald Trump, I know I'm, uh, yeah. uh, I'm long-winded. Yeah, yeah. I said uh, mm -hmm. brevity is not my forte. Mm -hmm. uh, um, the Republican platform on which he is running yes. is even more restrictive that we cannot expect much from in terms of its relationship with Africa. But... We have a sizable African diaspora that can use its electoral muscle, its political muscle, mm. to demand better. And Africa itself has to demand better, regardless whether Americans elect Hillary Clinton or Donald Trump. Africa has to negotiate a better deal. This is something that Dr. Milera uh, eloquently stated earlier. We have more than 30,000 American businesses doing business with Africa. Mm -hmm. We have over $27 billion of export in goods toward Africa, and Africa exports over $25 billion to the U.S. This is 2015 statistics. I hear you. This has to be expanded, and Africa can use this 
to negotiate a better deal. And Africa is a resource-rich continent. And the U.S. has a lot of political, economic, and security interests in the, in the continent that nobody could deny. I hear you. Well, talking about uh, conventions, uh, Dr. Monini Mulera, I gather that yes, uh, you are in London specifically to attend the ICOB convention. Briefly, what's ICOB? Uh, the International Community of Banyakigezi, uh, an organization that brings together uh, the sons and daughters of the Kigezi region in, south, in, in uh, uh, southwestern Uganda. What about those who say that uh, you are pretty much reminding them of uh, the arrangement that you used to obtain in apartheid South Africa, a sort of Bantustan, really? Uh, I can understand that sentiment, uh, but it denies the reality that uh, uh, as people from that particular region, we share common culture and traditions and the history. And we believe that when communities tackle that which they can, that which they are passionate about, the sum total will develop a country. So we have encouraged many other communities in Uganda to do likewise. And I can tell you, uh, we saw some groups form, the Bagesu uh, serving Bamasaba. We have, of course, the Baganda community, the Basoga community, working likewise, and we believe the sum total is good uh, for the society. I wish, actually, we would see that across all over Africa, where communities take a small part of Africa and say, we are going to work with our people to develop that. How do you respond to some who say, wait a minute, Dr. Munini Molera, you are talking about uh, an organization uh, that um, is accused to be partisan politically partisan. Again, I can understand that sentiment. Uh, you know, um, in Uganda, you are partisan if uh, you do not uh, particularly speak in favor of one particular leader or one particular party. Uh, the ICOB is registered in the United States of America as a non-profit tax-exempt organization. Under Section 501c3 of the United States IRS, an organization like ours cannot, absolutely cannot engage in partisan politics. And we have been in existence for 13 years, have never engaged in partisan politics, and we are not about to do that. I Secondly, I, mm -hmm. people, need to, or people also need to understand that because I hold particular views, particular political views, does not take away from my ability to put that aside and work with people from other political tendencies in order to make a difference to our community. This is done in Canada all the time. It's done in the United States, and hopefully we will see that uh, uh, beginning to be appreciated in Uganda. We are not partisan at all. Well, I gather that uh, you're offering yourself for the presidency. Good luck on that. Uh, and on that note, uh, thanks Thank to you. our distinguished guests. Our T. Welde Mikhail, Associate Professor of History at Queen's University in Ontario, Canada, and Dr. Munini Mulera, a consultant physician and analyst on African affairs. He joined us from VOA Studios in London. Thanks to our affiliate stations, along with our viewers and listeners, we thank you for tuning in. For many of our Voice of America radio affiliates, learning English is coming up next. And tomorrow morning, it's Daybreak Africa with James Bate. On behalf of the Voice of America, thanks for tuning in to Straight Talk Africa. In the meantime, get better, not beta, the African diaspora. And please remember to keep the African hopes alive. <laughs>